we could turn, please, in our Bibles to the Gospel according to Luke, please. Luke chapter 15. As you are returning, I would sincerely just like to thank your pastor, Reverend Patterson, very much in this session for the invitation to come along to your church in Cookstown this evening. And I would just like to give a personal word of thanks as well to the congregation for your prayers leading up to the meeting and also for your prayers this evening as well. It's very much appreciated. Do you trust that the Lord will bless us? It's a, a lovely thing to have a testimony as a Christian. And you know something? Uh, I had an interca- I had an altercation with the man the other week, and we happened to be talking. And anyway, we were talking away about different things, and he was a lot, using a lot of bad language and one thing and another. And then his next go off, he says, ah, he says, I go to church. And I says to myself, that's not a very good testimony, is it? And you know, brothers and sisters, it's a wonderful thing to have a testimony for the Lord, a faithful testimony to the Lord. So we're going to read uh, Luke chapter 15, and we're going to commence our reading in verse number 11. Let's hear the word of the Lord. And he said, that's Jesus, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with righteous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields fields, to feed swine. And he would fain, that word fain, uh, translated means gladly, have filled his belly with husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring in his hand, and shoes in his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and as alive again, he was lost, and is found. And they began to be merry. Amen. And we will end our reading in verse 24. We'll just uh, gather our time now before the Lord, and a little word of prayer, please. Our gracious God and eternal Father in heaven, we bow before you and our precious Saviour's name, that one indeed who is altogether lovely. And Father, we're so forever grateful, thankful here tonight that we're found gathered in thy house this evening. Right now, Father, we pray that you would close us in with thy blessing. We pray that you would, uh, Lord, uh, surround us, Lord, with your loving arms round about and underneath. We pray, Father, that we would be very cautious Lord, of thy presence with us tonight, because we do know that it is your presence that doeth, doth, maketh the feast. We pray for this congregation here in Cookstown, Lord. Lord, we just pray that indeed this evening that you would give us a spirit-filled congregation, Lord, that you would take away every distracting thought. And Lord, as it, as it has already been prayed, we pray, Lord, for the sick of the congregation. Lord, thou knowest them by, the, by name. You knowest their every need. And Father, we just pray that you would be near and dear to the work here in Cookstown. Bless the pastor and his family. Father, we pray that you would be one of our number tonight, Lord. We, uh, we long to meet with thee. Father, we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I just want to leave a few thoughts with you as, um, before I do share my testimony with you. It's a very familiar story with us, and that is, of course, the story of the prodigal son. And it's three very simple thoughts that I would like to leave with you. And first of all, that is the path that this younger son chose. The path that he chose. And we see this in verses 12 
and 13, and we'll read them again together. The Bible says, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not so many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with righteous living. Here we see in these two uh, passages of scripture that this younger son, he went to his father and he basically says, Dad, the money you have left to me, I want it now. And what he done was, this younger son, he took the money in his pocket, and do you want to know what? He couldn't wait to get away quick enough. And the Bible tells us in these two verses that he went into a far country. So in other words, he didn't just go to Cook or Stewartstown or Dungannon. He went off to a far, far country. And you know something? That's oftentimes what we maybe thought whenever we get, before we got saved, wasn't it? The more money I have in my pocket, the further I am away, the more fun I have. Because we see here in verse 13, that word righteous living, in other words, it basically means that this was a fellow that was completely off the rails. He was off the radar and he was completely out of control. Why? Because he was having fun with his sin and with the way he was living his life. And you know, that's what we think as well, isn't it? The more money I have, the further I am away, I'm going to have great fun. But we know that that's a life in the devil, don't we? How do we know that? Look at verse number 14. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And listen to the next bit of the verse. And he began to be in want. He began to be in want. And you see, this is the thing. Whenever the money was all gone, and money will disappear quickly, especially this day, day and age with the prices of things, they're through the roof, aren't they? And he began to be in want. And you know something? This is the picture of sin. What do I mean by that there? It's very short-lived. You see, there's only pleasure in sin for a short season. Basically, it's fake. It's counterfeit. It's fraud. Everything that the world has to offer you, it doesn't last forever. It's only short-lived. But praise God tonight, we do have a message for each and every one of you. And that is with God. Everything is eternal, it's everlasting, it's genuine, and praise God it's real. So we see the path that he chose, but secondly, consider with me the path that it took him. And we read in verse number 15, And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine, and he would have gladly filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. Here we see a young fellow that was basically turned to total humility. This fellow, at one stage, he had a pile of money. He was having fun with his sin, with his righteous living, the Bible was telling us. And here is a picture of what sin will do to each and every one of us. I want you to visually uh, acknowledge for a minute what was actually going on here at the minute. You imagine this fella, he was actually on his hands and knees, eating with these pigs. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think it would have been a nice smell, do you? Pigs aren't very nice at smell. But the Bible tells us that he wasn't reluctant, but yet he gladly would have ate with these pigs. And you see, this was basically, this fella was turned from his pride, and he was basically humbled. In other words, he ate a bit of humble pie. And we see in verse 17, he sa the Bible says, And when he came to himself, in other words, whenever he came to his right mind, whenever he came to his right way of thinking. And you know something I dare say, I would believe that this man came to the absolute end of himself. What do I mean by that? He was finished with his sin. He was done the way he was living his life. Whenever he realized that the way he was living his life there was no everlasting happiness with it. Whenever all the money was gone, his pleasure very quickly disappeared. And you know, he was starving with hunger. The Bible tells us in verse 17 that his father's servants had more food than him. 
And he says that the, the, Jesus says at the end of verse 17, he says, and I perish with hunger. In other words, here was a man that was absolutely starving. And here's another illustration of what sin does. It will leave you absolutely empty. But see, whenever you have Jesus Christ in your heart and in your life, you're filled. I don't know about you, but I have a favorite Bible verse, and that is Matthew 5 and verse 6. And it's one of the Beatitudes, and it says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Not for they shall be empty, but they shall be filled. And you see, this is the thing. The world will never leave you fully satisfied. There'll always be that want and there'll always be that void in your life without Jesus Christ as your own personal saviour. Thirdly, I just want to add, add from a last point, the path that led him, the path that it led him, um, he wasn't happy at all, and what he thought would make him happy, it didn't last very long. And verse, verse number 18, he not only acknowledged his sin to his earthly father, but most importantly, number one, he noticed and acknowledged his sin against heaven. And that really is the simplicity of the gospel. If you're in this meeting tonight, and if you're not saved, you haven't yet, put, haven't yet trusted in Christ as your own and personal saviour, you basically need to acknowledge your sin before a holy God. If you think that you can get to heaven by uh, trusting in your pastor, by a church, by a priest, by good works, by paying into a church, you're very wrong. Why? Because we're all sinners, and the Bible tells, tells us that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And this is really the humility that a Christian has. You know, before I get saved, before I get right with God, I can personally say, to my shame, that I was one of the most critical people out there, especially with Christians. Why? Because I was unhappy myself. And you know, it's a true saying, what, what is in must come out. And I was very, very critical of Christians and of churches because I was so, so unhappy myself. And you know, if unbelievers uh, just stop the opinion, they maybe think, and this is what I thought too, that maybe Christians thought that they were perfect. And do you want to know what? It's completely the opposite. See, a Christian, a person that is born again, we see our flaws, we see our weaknesses, and we see our need of a Savior. In other words, we come to the Lord total and total humility. Because if it wasn't for the Lord, we wouldn't have the so great salvation. You see, John, uh, the Bible tells us in the Gospel of John, chapter 14 and 6, uh, the Lord says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And it really is as simple as that. It's, acknowledge, it's acknowledging your sin and asking for God's forgiveness and trusting him as your own and personal Savior. And just the final closing thought we, in verse number 20, we see the picture of the love that our Heavenly Father has for us. The Bible says, And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And this is a beautiful picture, really, even though this was his earthly father, but our Heavenly Father is saying the exact same to us tonight. You're maybe in this meeting tonight and you can say, Matthew, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what sin I've committed. You know, I'm, I'm a bad man. I'm a bad woman. Well, you know, the Father is saying to you, he loves you, he has compassion on you, and he's ready to forgive you. Why? Because he loves you and he died for you. We see the path that this younger son took, the prodigal son, but now I want to share a brief few moments and tell you the path that I chose, the path that I chose. Now I dare say if there was a raise of hands, if I asked for a raise of hands to say, who was brought up in a Christian home? I would dare say most majority, maybe if not all the congregation could say that they were brought up in a Christian home. And you know, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you tonight that if you were brought up in a Christian home, of how blessed and how privileged you were. I didn't have such that I didn't have such a blessing, a blessing and a privilege as being brought up in a Christian home. But one thing I did have was I did have a godly influence in my life, and that was my granny and my granda 
were both saved people. And I also had an aunt who is a Sunday school teacher. And they would have took me along to church whenever I was at a very young age. And you know, it wasn't too long before the Spirit of God started working in my life, even as a young boy. And I recognized my need for the Savior. And you know, I actually professed faith in Christ as a young boy. But sadly, ultimately, whenever I was old enough and big enough in my own eyes, that there was no depth in that profession. And it's oftentimes so sad to hear. We always hear of it nowadays that about young people setting God aside and wanting to do their own thing because we think that we know better. And I was exactly the same. And you know, life for me was pretty tough growing up. I was, I was actually born in the town called Antrim. And then I was later, uh, sorry, very quickly uh, was brought up in the town of Randallstown. I, I was brought up uh, in a broken home. My mum and dad um, separated whenever I was very, very young. And um, my, my dad wasn't a very nice person without getting into too much personal detail. My mother also had her own struggles growing up also. She, uh, she was actually an alcoholic while I was growing up as well, and I had a younger sister. So with the things that I'm telling you, you can say, well, life was pretty tough growing up, and it was. And by the way, I am not for one second making an excuse uh, for the events that happened in my life for the path that I chose, because at the end of the day, we all, we all make our own choices, don't we? And that's is that we make good choices or we make bad choices. And sadly, unfortunately, I made the wrong choices in life. So uh, I struggled through primary school. I attended um, Randallstown Central Primary School. And um, there was another thing that, that took place in my life, and that was uh, my mental health um, was quite bad, even as a, as, a, as a young boy as well. And I'll never forget it. My, I went to my GP. It's not a thing to be boasting about, but it's just to give you a visual insight. I went to my GP practice in Randallstown, and my own GP told me, he says, uh, Matthew, you're the youngest person I have ever prescribed antidepressants to. And I was prescribed antidepressants as a 12-year-old boy. I don't blame anything of the events that took place in my life. Sadly, this was just what I had seen, uh, the way my life was going, even as a boy of 12. And I stopped going to church, even with making that profession whenever I was young. To be honest with you, truth be told, if I tell the honest truth, church became boring, it became unappealing. I just didn't want to do it anymore. If I'm being honest before you, and more importantly, being honest before the Lord. And I went to uh, secondary school in Antrim, Park Hall Secondary School in Antrim in first year. And there was another event that sadly took place in my life, and that was I experienced getting bullied at school. And unfortunately, the bullying got so bad where I actually got pulled out of that high school. And I was then sent back to my primary school to get tuition uh, in my primary school. I then went to uh, Colabaki Secondary School for my second year of high school. And there was a pivotal event that took place in my life, and that was I started indulging in the things of this world. Now, bear in mind, I knew the truth, and it's like many in our province today they have heard the gospel so many times, but yet they still decide to do things their way and to live life their way. And Matthew Hunter was exactly one of those people. Wanted to do my own thing, had no interest of what Christian people had to say, had no interest of what the preacher had to say. Why? Because I was full of pride, I was puffed up. I knew better. They don't need to tell me what to do. I can live life my way. And that's exactly what I thought and I started uh, smoking a cigarette, as oftentimes it happens in people's lives. Whenever you smoke a cigarette, you're rest assured that it won't just end at a cigarette. I'm not saying that um, it doesn't happen 100% of the time, but it happens a good majority of the time. And a cigarette can be classed as a gateway drug. What I mean by that is, if someone smokes a cigarette, you're destined to try something else. Whether it's a, a glass of beer, whether it's a smoke of cannabis or tablets or whatever else it may be, you're destined to try other things. And sadly, unfortunately, that's the way it was in my life also. Very quickly, um, I found myself going on to smoking cannabis to try and 
uh, other party drugs, the likes of ecstasy and speed. Now, may I add that this was actually whenever I was under the age of 16. Now, there's young people and they're actually younger than 16. Or maybe they are 16 in this church tonight. And look at the way I was living my life, even as a young boy. And you know, this was even before I had even sat my GCSEs as well. Truth be told, again to my shame, but I didn't like school. And maybe I speak for other, other people in here tonight where they didn't like school and they couldn't wait to get left. Well, I was one of them people as well. I really didn't like school. And I um, had no interest in doing uh, exams or one thing or another. But one thing I did have was, and that was a good work ethic. And I landed my first job in a petrol station in a hockel. This was previous to working in farms and working in car washes and things like that there as well. Now, again, I'm going to be very blunt and going to be very honest. That's why I'm here tonight, to share my life story. And very simply, I stole uh, from working in that petrol station in a little village of a hockel. And the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. And truth be told, I thought I had get away with stealing for out of that shop. But the Lord seen it, even though maybe other people didn't see it, but the Lord seen it, and I was found out. And with the result of that there, I got sacked from that job. And I was out of work for a period of time, for probably about six months. And this brings us up into about 2007, 2008. And the recession had hit quite hard at that time, if some of you can remember. And my uncle, who's a joiner by trade, the work had dried up. And he basically had a, had a vision to start up his own business. So what he done was he started, uh, he, he started his own business. And that was a gym. That was actually a bodybuilding gym um, in the nearby town of Balamina. And with me being family, with me being a nephew, with uh, him being my uncle, he gave me a, a job uh, part-time and gradually into full-time. The work had picked back up again. Uh, my uncle had went back out to work and he left me in charge of his business with the everyday running. I was in charge of other staff, I was in charge of wages, cleaning rotors, just the general running of a business. And he had left me in charge of that there. But little did he know what his nephew was doing behind his back and what was going on behind the scenes. Now, I don't um, speak bad of a gym or anybody going to a gym, but at the same time, people need to be aware of the dangers of going to a gym. I was unaware of the, those dangers before I started working in the gym. And that was um, the accessibility to drugs in some gyms, the accessibility to anabolic steroids to enhance your training gains. I was very naive about really what went on in the outside world. Even though uh, I took a smoke, I took a drink, I uh, had experienced other drugs, uh, I still would have classed myself about living in a bubble. You know, I still classed myself as pretty sensible, even though I wasn't sensible. And what happened next was the point where I was introduced to my addiction. Now, by the way, before I start, if you had said to me several, several years ago, Matthew, you will be a drug addict, you will become a drug addict, I would never have believed you. But do you want to know something? Absolutely none of us is exempt from the trials and troubles of life. Absolutely none of us. And I get introduced to the drug called cocaine whenever I worked in this gym. And I tried it for the first time, and oftentimes, as sin does, it starts off as fun and games, doesn't it? It's all a bit of fun, and it's all harmless, and it'll never lead to anything else, and nobody will find out about it, and it can be my little secret, and nobody, nobody has to know about it. And that's what I thought. And you know, I could have took it or left it at the weekends. I had total control and ownership of it at the start. I was socially active with it. I was going out at the weekends to nightclubs and pubs. And I was taking it and I was able to leave it and I was able to go to my work. But there's also the other side of addiction and of sin. And that is the fun and games will not last forever. And it's about what I spoke again with this prodigal son with the money. See once, the, see, once the money was gone, the fun and games had stopped, and the reality had actually hit home. And it was exactly the same of what I was experience, experiencing in my own life as well. And you know, within a very quick period of time, I found this drug 
called cocaine. I had total control over my life. It used to be that I had control over it, but very quickly it had total control over me, where it totally consumed me. And again, I'm going to be very honest and very blunt about it tonight. I actually found myself on occasions stealing off my own uncle to feed my own drug habit. Now, I'm ashamed to say that, but I'm here tonight to tell the truth and to tell the, the truth before God. And even though I was fully aware of what I was doing, the reality was that I couldn't help myself because my need and my greed was so much more than the need that my uncle had for, to provide for the business and to pay wages and to make a living. This kind of brings us up into about 2015 where things was about to get so much more worse. Um, I, I had owed money to maybe six or several drug dealers at the time. And it was always a case of robbing Peter to pay Paul. And what I mean by that is I would have went to the person that I owed the least money to to get drugs. But yet again, the person that I owed the most money to was on the phone looking their money. And this is exactly what I was doing. And oftentimes, what I tell people whenever I'm sharing my testimony, do you ever see a wee hamster and a wheel where it's going round and round and round and round in this wee wheel? Well, that's exactly what my life was like. It was just a continual pattern day in and day out. And in fact, I oftentimes would have went to bed at night and I actually would have cried my heart out and I would have prayed to God to take me out of this life. Why? Because my life was an absolutely walking, talking misery. See, the only time that I had peace from, from overthinking and peace from my own head was whenever I was sleeping. And that, that was my honest, sincere prayer at that time that I would have went to sleep and that I wouldn't have woke up because my life was such a misery. And two, the summer of 2015, um, I had owed money and I got lured to a house in a nearby town. And I'm going to fast forward the story uh, from me coming out of that house. Um, the result of me getting into that house was I, I get badly beat up and I get both my cheekbones broke I got my left eye socket fractured. Uh, in fact, I nearly lost the sight in my left eye. And it goes without saying it was, a, it was an awful, awful ordeal. In fact, I have tears in my eyes even talking about it because I still have the, the memory of it, if you get me. And you know, I went into that house, and it's only by the grace of God and by the hand of God upon me, I walked into that house with... The clothes I had on my back and the shoes on my feet. And I, I exited that house and I hadn't one speck of blood in my clothes. Don't ask me how it happened. Well, I do know how it happened. is because the Lord was with me. And I drove home and my face was in excruciating pain. It was just pulsating. It was throbbing. And I went home and my mother didn't really know what had took place. And she went into my bedroom the next morning and I had the bed sheets over my face. And she says, why have you got your face covered? And I says, mum, I says, I'm going to show you something here, but you need to promise me that you won't be scared. And she says, I promise. And I pulled down the bed sheets and she just burst into tears. And of course, with me seeing my mum upset, I burst into tears too. And that's the devastating thing about somebody in addiction and somebody that's lost in their sin. It wasn't just affecting me, but it was affecting my family. It was affecting my mum, my younger sister, my granny, my grunda, my wee nephews. It was bringing everybody else down along with me. And see, after that terrible ordeal, that still wasn't enough for me to change. You see, here's the reality tonight, that sin will bring you down as far as you want to go. In other words... I know this sounds harsh, but this is the fierce reality. Some people's rock bottom can result in the death. And the Bible does clearly say that, for the wages of sin is death. And the way I was going, as a man says, I was near death's door. The way I was getting all of my life. There was only going to be one way for me if I didn't sort myself out, and that was going to be death. Or else in prison or something. And I can honestly say that Throughout my, life, throughout my addiction, 
I was truly seeking for that change and for that hope. Why? Because praise the Lord, that seed was planted in me as a young boy. I knew the truth. And the Bible says, for you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But I was far from free. I was in total bondage. I was in chains, and I was slave to my sin. And the Bible, that Bible verse that I quoted there a brief minute ago, the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. Well, that verse came true in my life once again. And it was another stealing incident, because that's what people in addiction do. They lie, they manipulate, and they steal. That's one of many characteristics that somebody in addiction will do. And I, to my shame, I took a fella's week's wages. And instead of paying that man his week's wages, what did I do? Well, I went into the nearby town and I spent it on drugs. And my uncle rung me and he had, we were talking away about how the day went. He says, did you pay that fella? I says, I did, surely. And then I went, I went on, the phone call ended, I went, and dri- and went on driving. My phone rang, rang, rung again, it was a very short space of time later, and it was my uncle. And see, as soon as I seen his name come up on my phone, my heart sunk. Because I knew that I had finally been found out. And you know, I had chance after chance after chance after chance that I was given. But yet I took advantage every time. Because that change never came. And I answered the phone. And he says, Matthew, I'm going to ask you again. He says, did you pay that fella? And I hesitated for about five seconds. And you could hear the pin drop. And I says, I did. He says, you're a liar. You're a liar. He says, he's only after ringing me there to see what was wrong. And that verse came true in my life. I had been found out. And I can honestly, sincerely say that that was the last time that I was on my way for cocaine because my sin had found me out and my chances had become no more. I had run out of chances. And of course, rightly so, my uncle sacked me. He says, Matthew, he says, that's me and you finished. In fact, I dare say, if I was with him face to face, that he would have hit me a slap in the mouth. And do you want to know something? I would have fully deserved it as well for what I was putting my family through. I was putting them through absolute misery due to what was taking place in my life. And as I said a brief few moments ago, with that seed being planted for me as a young boy, I knew the only thing that could set me free, and that was getting right with God and getting a relationship with him. And I was searching, I was seeking on social media, and I was typing things in on the internet like, help for drug addiction, Christian help for drug addiction. And I stumbled across a page on Facebook called uh, The Answer to Addiction. And it's run by a very dear friend of mine. Now he's become a very dear friend. And that is a man called Chris Killen. And he is a a missionary to to people with addiction problems across Northern Ireland. And I remember he was advertising a meeting and another fellow was testifying he actually had been set free from a heroin addiction and I can remember again I'm not going to tell you any word of a lie that the tears started tripping me again because at this stage the, the fun and games had well and truly be, they, they had finished and I was a broken man I was a broken soul and as I said a few moments ago I no longer wanted to live anymore I was so so depressed to be quite honest and my family was totally unaware that I was watching these videos. And my family obviously got to a stage where they didn't know what to do with me. But yet my aunt, who is the Sunday school teacher, she rung a man to see about trying to get me some help. And that man was, of course, Chris Killen. And I'll never forget it. It was a Sunday night after church. And Chris came from church. And I, was a, I wasn't taking cocaine at the time, but I was still drinking. I was still smoking. And I was an absolute mess. And I can remember saying to Chris, and I was crying at this stage too, that, you know, I, I was, again, I emphasize I was a broken soul. And I says, Chris, I says, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to change my life. And you see, this is the thing, brother and sisters, if you have a family member, if you have a loved one, if you're maybe even in this meeting tonight, and some people are trying to help you, you need to ask yourself the question, or that person individually needs to ask themselves the question, 
Do they want help? Because, you know, it goes without saying, a person, an individual, can get as much help, they can get as much love and support as they want. But see, unless it comes from them personally, there's nothing we can do, apart from one thing, and that is pray. That's why I'm behind this pulpit tonight, is because people were praying for me. And can I encourage you here as a congregation in Cookstown this evening to encourage us as keep on praying. The Bible says uh, men not ought to faint but to pray. We need to pray for our loved ones. I don't know about you but it breaks my heart that I have family members that are still not saved. Completely breaks my heart. I have a mum who's backslid. I have a sister who has a similar story to me. She made a profession whenever she was younger but she's living in the world. And it breaks my heart. And I have no doubt and imagination that each and every one of you, if not most of you, has loved ones that still isn't saved. So can I encourage us tonight to keep on praying because God can change things. So Chris came out and seen me and he was all about getting people into residential treatment. And I knew that was the only thing that could give me a chance. Now, by the way, it wasn't a Christian residential program that changed my life, but it was used as a tool to help me to get the right foundation, to get me the right platform. And that was, in some effect, a greenhouse uh, environment that I was going to be placed in. It was going to be a Christian home. I was going to have no worldly influences. There was going to be no smoking. There was going to be no drinking. It was going to be a Christian men's home. So I was originally meant to go to... Um, New Hope Residential Centre in the south of Dublin, a place called Tala. And this was uh, December 2017. So I can remember me and uh, Chris, we were sitting, uh, having a coffee, and we were filling in this application. And things were finally starting to look up in my life, because I was thinking, right, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to change here. I want to get right with God. But God had other plans. I would have had to have waited one month to get into that residential centre in Dublin. And it was put forth to me by... Uh, a few men in our denomination who has a registered charity to help people and the, the Chris rung me and he says Matthew, how would you feel about going to America for your Christian residential treatment and I says Chris I says no bother, I says I'll go now and I flew out to uh, Chicago on the 20th of December 2015 and it was a Christian residential treatment centre it was, it was through it's basically a Christian residential program under the umbrella of a, of a New Testament church. And it was through a Baptist church out there that I went to this home. And the very first question I got asked whenever I went into this home, there was 43 men in this home. So you can only but imagine what it was like. It was good fun. It was challenging, but it was good. And the very first question I got asked when I was in that home was, are you saved? And I posed the same question to you tonight. There's many is saved, but possibly there's one in our gathering here tonight that's not saved. And I ask you that personal question. Are you saved? Can you say that your sins have been forgiven and that you've trusted in the shed blood of Calvary? And you know, that very first night I went into that home, I got down before the Lord and I poured my heart out to him. And I asked for his forgiveness. And I asked him very, very simply, I says, God, I says, do your work in my heart and in my life and you see that's what happens whenever you get saved the Lord starts doing the change in the inside and then visually you should be able to see on the outside that that person that individual has changed and God has done a marvelous marvelous work in my life that night in that men's home in America I'm speaking about nearly five years ago it'll be five it'll be five years ago this December that I made that choice to get right with God and see, since I have made that choice, I can't express enough how my life has truly changed. Not briefly changed, truly changed. Why? The Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are ha passed away. Praise God, all things are become new. You see, Matthew Hunter no longer wants to smoke and to take cannabis and to take cocaine. Why? because I have new desires. And see my desires as wholeheartedly as to serve the Lord with all my heart. Why? Because he has done absolutely everything 
for me and for you. And it's my heart's desire that I serve him with everything that I have. Uh, finished that program. Uh, it was a six-month program. You were put through uh, various uh, Bible curriculum. You were taught the fruits of the Spirit. You were taught how to pray. You were taught how to read the Bible. You were taught how to basically get a personal relationship with God, which I never knew how to do, and I never experienced in my life. And I started seeking God about my life because I knew if I went home to Randallstown and lay about the house, I knew it wasn't going to be good for my mind, and I had to be at something. So I started seeking the Lord, and uh, I get a phone call, or so it was actually an email whenever I was in America, from the fella that run the men's home in Dublin. This was the place that I was originally meant to go. And I got offered, the, the man says to me that runs it, his name's Leighton Kelly, and he says, Matthew, he says, we could do with an extra pair of hands down here, would you be willing to come down and volunteer? I says, certainly, no problem. So I spent a few weeks with my family back home, and I dare say my family was thinking, I wonder if Matthew has really, really changed. I wonder if we'll give him a few weeks, a few months, and he'll be back to his old ways. And I dare say that's what they thought. Because if it was anything to go with my past records, it would have been true. But yet tonight I stand here and I'm a new creature in Christ. Praise the Lord. And I went down to Dublin. I actually lived down in Tala for nearly a year, for 10 months. And it was a great privilege. It was a great humbling experience to be from me being in a residential program to me actually being a staff member in a, in a residential program. And the Lord done some amazing things. I led uh, my first soul to the Lord, and that was actually a young fellow from Cork. I showed him from the scriptures that he was a sinner, and I showed him how he could be saved. And that evening in his bed room, he actually trusted in the Lord as, own, as his own and personal saviour. Now, I'll be honest, I'm a bit of a homebird, even though I was in the Lord's work down in Dublin. I started missing home. And I was missing my home church in Randallstown. But I knew that I was in God's will, so therefore I was content. But yet I was praying that the Lord would reveal his will to me. And that's what we all want as believers, as Christians, isn't it? We want to know and we want to be in the center of God's will in our lives. I'm no different than news. So basically I get a phone call one day from a man who knew my history, knew all about my background, and he offered me a full-time job. And he says, Matthew, we have spoke to your pastor, we've been praying about this, we know that you've been praying about this, and there's a full-time job for you here if you would like it. And I came back down home after working 10 months in the, in the residential home, and I've now been working full-time for nearly three years this year. And I know it maybe doesn't seem like a lot to some people, but do you want to know what? It feels so good to be living a normal life. But then again, it depends what you class as normal. But I class myself now as a normal individual that's just seeking to do right, right in life. Uh, I became a member of my local church in Randallstown as well. I do believe it's very important to become a member of your own fellowship. And not only that, you have all heard of the, the saying that we're saved to serve, but we're not saved to sit. And that is the most important thing that I would encourage, especially the young people, to get involved in the church, to serve in the church. You're serving the Lord. And it should be our utmost desire to serve the Lord with everything that we have. With that being said, the Lord has really, really blessed me. And I'm now a, a Sunday school teacher teaching children at Sunday school. And you know, less than five years ago, I was a drug addict. And it's only a change that God can do in somebody's life. It wasn't me. Believe you me, I didn't have the strength to do it. But the Lord changed me. Changed me from the inside. He'd done a work in my heart and he'd done a work in my life. I'm now in the position where uh, I'm out helping Chris doing visitations, helping men and women with stubborn habits and addictions. Um, the Lord has given me opportunities to share my testimony all across the country. Um, in fact, I have a busy month this month. I, have, I think I have three testimonies and two youth meetings, so you can keep me in your prayers in the upcoming month. But honestly, folks, I, I don't want to be long-winded here. I know that I'm cautious of my time, but I just want to challenge each and every one of you tonight and encourage you that it is the Lord. The Lord can change anybody, and there's nobody too far gone. You know, the things I've done in my life, if it was put up on the wall behind us tonight, I would be ashamed. 
absolutely ashamed. But you know what? The blood is worthy for forgiveness. I know that my sins are under the blood. And see, being a Christian, I know I'm not perfect, but I know I'm forgiven. You see, salvation is instant, but sanctification takes a lifetime. I close with the words of Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And I'll read it to you as it's just two verses. Romans chapter 12, and it's the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. And listen to the next bit, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this word, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, believer, how do we know the will of God? What we do is we present our bodies to him, a living, holy sacrifice, acceptable unto him. That's how we know the will of God, as we give our life to him, We seek God's will for our lives. For those that's not saved, possibly in this building tonight, would you come tonight and taste and see that the Lord is good?